It's my pleasure to welcome Nicholas Negroponte, the chairman and founder of One Laptop Per Child. It's created millions of affordable laptops to children in developing a country around the world. And today he's going to discuss how we can achieve universal primary education. It's a real honor to welcome to our stage Nicholas Negroponte. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I just got the best news a speaker can ever have, and that was I was told I have three minutes extra. So I will use it judiciously. But there's something about what I'm going to say today that was very, very different than what I used to say as recently as two, three, four years ago, if any of you heard me speak. And that is that we now have almost 3 million of these laptops in 40 countries, 25 languages. And it's not a proposition. It's not a piece of fancy anymore. And it costs the total cost of ownership, purchase, maintenance, updating, connecting, theft, breakage, etc., $1 per week per child to do what I'm talking about. So that's a high number. $1 per week is not cheap, but it's also affordable, and so this isn't quite as ridiculous as some commercial interests might sometimes tell you. One Laptop Per Child was started by myself and a man named Seymour Papert, uh, who Seymour particularly, and myself certainly uh, by affiliation, were interested in how children learn. It wasn't about school. It wasn't about sort of technology in the classroom. It was how do children learn and what part of that learning can happen through the children themselves. And here's why that's important. In rough numbers, there are about 100 million children who do not go to school. By that I mean do not go to first grade. It's not that they've dropped out in the third or fourth grade. If you look at the statistics that maybe are being more official, the number is 69 million. Um, I think that's a little low because there are quite a few children who officially go to school, but when they get there, there's no school, or there's the teacher, but the teacher is drunk or absent. Um, when I visited Libya, I learned that something like 25% of the teachers just never went to school. And there are a couple of countries I've visited where a large number of the teachers, I don't remember the percentages exactly, were dead. They just weren't reported so by the families because the checks kept coming. So you get situations, Afghanistan is one, which are so extreme, 25% of the teachers in Afghanistan are illiterate. Amazing. The next 25% have only had one grade of education beyond the children they're teaching. So if they're teaching third graders, they've had fourth graders. 75% of the girls don't go to school, 50% of the boys. Now, when you see situations like that, it's not a matter of saying, well, let's build more schools and train more teachers. Yes, let me go on record again and again, though people forget it. Yes, do that. Train more teachers and build more schools. But taking just that approach, we're going to be waste, waiting a very long time. And so the question is the following. Can you do something much sooner and much faster? And I believe the answer is yes, and now we have actual data and experiences that support that. And the answer comes from leveraging the children themselves. Children are pretty good at learning, and in the first five years of life, we all do a lot of learning, learning by doing. We learn to walk, we learn to talk, we learn a lot about common sense. We learn these things without going to common sense school or walking school or talking school. You learn them by interacting with your environment and so on, and suddenly at about the age six, you're asked to stop learning, by and large, that way, and do your learning by being told, by being told by a teacher, by being told by a book. But most of it, not all of it, but most of it is through that channel. So what happens when children don't have school or don't have a particularly good school? So let me go through some of these slides quickly. Um, 
And we're not newcomers to this. Seymour and I, in 1982, did the use, this is before the IBM PC, by the way, Apple II, in Pakistan, Colombia, and Senegal. And this is in Senegal, outside of Dakar. We were way early, but we learned one thing. This girl in this picture didn't speak French, didn't speak English, spoke only Wolof, but played that keyboard like a piano. So what we learned is that these kids were fish in water. They would, they would pick this up very naturally. And in the year 2000, I don't know why the one's missing, but it's supposed to say 2001. <laughs> That's strange. Um, it was transmitted over the internet, so, so the one disappeared. Um, this picture really affected me. I had built the school. My son had gone there and lived in this remote village in Cambodia. $40 was the average income, no electricity, no telephone, no television, and he connected it so all the kids had laptops. You'll see a satellite dish in the background. They were all connected. They went home with their laptops at night, and the parents loved it. And they loved it because it was the brightest light source in the house. There was no electricity. And so when I went to this village, I said, wow, this is the tooth fairy, me, going into a village. And people have written books about this, and you've Greg Mortensen, uh, uh, others, the Room to Read. There are many people that have had that experience. But what I said to them is, how could we scale it? How could we make this happen? And when I looked at the picture, I felt the laptop was the piece that the normal market forces won't do. And for people who are in the audience, who are considering being what are now called social entrepreneurs, I'll tell you the question I ask every morning when I wake up. Will normal market forces do what I'm doing? And if the answer is yes, stop. I don't want to do what normal market forces will do. Normal market forces will do them. And they'll do them better than I and the group of people that may be working with me or around me that be do it better than MIT, better than one laptop per child. But there's certain things normal market forces don't do. And I didn't think doing a lo low-cost laptop would do that. And then I said, I've got to do it as a nonprofit. Not as a profit, but as a nonprofit association for among other reasons that we'd have really interesting partners. So the UN was a partner. Um, Kofi Annan was uh, an enormous advocate of it. And when we announced it in Tunis in November of the year 2005, we announced and we showed this machine. Cute as hell, very unrealistic, um, but it worked. And it worked as an engineering model, and I had them there in Tunis. And because of Kofi Annan, there were wall-to-wall -wall cameras all over the place. And as we're doing this, the voice comes out from the rear of the room and says, Kofi Annan and Nicholas Negroponte, crank your laptops. So we close our laptops, we move it to the edge of the table, and I'm cranking mine, he's cranking his. And as he's cranking his, the handle falls off in his hand. He is such a cool cucumber, he doesn't look down. He just keeps moving his hand <laughs> while the sort of thing. I don't think anybody saw it, but it was a wonderful way to get started. What we ended up doing was different. I'll show it to you for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, it's been widely distributed, but most importantly, it turns into a book and a games machine as well. The trans the, the tr it transforms into those. And this is very important. When we ship one of these into a village, it has 100 books on it. Well, that's no big deal. But when we ship into a village 100 laptops, which isn't a big deal, to 100 kids, each one has 100 different books. So that's 10,000 books in that village, where the village had previously had zero. So it's very important. Being a games machine was pretty important, too. Um, and then these little ears pop up, people smile, that connects them to each other, very broadband, so-called mesh network. If there's no internet connectivity, then they just connect to themselves, so at least you can share the 10,000 books. But if one of them's connected, and we usually uh, have that be the case, then all the others are connected. So that's, that's pretty important. And we started, we started very differently than we ended up. These are the stats, depends uh, what you count as being a country. Um, we started thinking that we would go to 
six countries, Thailand, um, Pakistan, Nigeria, Libya, Brazil, and Argentina. Pretty nicely geo-heterogeneous split, and you had sort of a little bit of everything in those six countries. <clears throat> and in each of those six countries, there is somewhere a picture of Nicholas hugging the head of state, it's one of me and Gaddafi and Lula and Kirchner and Musharraf and Shinawatra and Obasanjo, all saying, we will do every child in our country. Well, that's not a purchase order, but it certainly got the Taiwanese, who were designing it along with MIT and one laptop per child, motivated enough to build the laptop. But then when it came time to do it, it was clear that those six giants weren't going to really do it, and other countries came along. This is Peru, and all you need to do is look at that young girl's face. She's going to grow up differently. Um, the concentration and so on. So Peru, Uruguay, and Rwanda were the three countries that stepped forward and said, we will do it. One, lap per, one laptop per child, every child in the country. And Uruguay completed that a year and a half ago. Every single child in Uruguay has a laptop from the age of 5 to 15, completely connected. I only showed this one because when we were designing the laptop, I said to Eve Behar, the designer, I said, Eve, this has to be in the Museum of Modern Art. I just really believe that good design and, and sort of thinking and all of that's important. And we worked so hard on the handle uh, of the laptop. And so this is how she carries it. Um, this, is, this is Nepal. I don't even know who takes these pictures. If you go to Flickr, you'll find the last time I looked, 25,000 pictures. Uh, that, are, that have in their label one laptop per child, or OLPC. Uh, this is Afghanistan. Now, this picture is really important to me, and the reason it's important to me is that this child is teaching, in this case, his grandparents. In Peru, there are almost a million laptops. Most of them are in the remote villages. They're not in Lima. And in these remote villages, the kids really are teaching their parents how to read and write. And if that doesn't put goosebumps on your goosebumps, I have nothing else to say. Because those kids are getting self-esteem, they're getting a passion to learn, and their parents are very great. It's a totally different relationship. And it doesn't invert the, the parent-child relationship in, this, in any other sense than bringing them closer and closer and bringing the one thing that's the most important and school often whips out of you, and that is the love for learning. And so it's very, very important. Teaching is one of the tools to gain a love for learning. Kids working together, um, we just brought a man named Sugata Mitra, who did the Hole in the Wall project. He's come to MIT full time for two years, and it's really about that collective learning process. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit at the very end about what we're doing. <clears throat> this picture is perhaps the most important one uh, that I'll show you, because this teacher taught class in a very disciplinarian fashion. There were perfect lines that the kids sat in on little white towels that ran down on the floor, and they sat there like frozen statues because they didn't dare ask a question. This is how he teaches today. The kids run to class. The parents hang in the windows. And he, I met him actually, and he said, I, I've, I've never had so much fun teaching that it just completely changed, and that's the key to something like one laptop per child. So what are we doing now? Well, like everybody else, we're building a tablet. We announced it about <coughs> six months, <laughs> six months before the iPad came out, but uh, we, we take our time at it, and this tablet is going to be, and again, unlike the laptop, it's interesting, we don't have to build the tablet. We just have to threaten to build the tablet and sort of have the whole assembly line up and running because it'll cost and its bill of materials will be under $100. But it has some other properties. Um, when you open it up, <clears throat> the cover is a solar panel. You just let it out in the sun while you're indoors and there's a battery in the cover that when you put it back on, uh, it charges. And that's very important because there is no electricity in many of these villages. And yes, it should be put in and yes, uh, as Ted Turner said, of course, it's, it's a human right almost to have electricity, but when there isn't and 
these schools aren't connected, uh, that's absolutely critical. And so that's, the, that's the, the laptop story. So let me tell you what we're doing right now. <coughs> uh, one laptop per child has spun out. There's a, another NGO, also nonprofit, based in Miami. It does all the things that, you know, the, the laptops and probably they'll have four or five million of them out uh, in the, within the next year, maybe a few more. What we've done is we've gone back and we've said, what is key to self-learning? What is the key that, a, the, sort of the, the basic step? The basic step is very simple. The basic step is learning to read. If you learn to read, you can read to learn. There's a real cusp at that point. For those of you who have children or grandchildren or nephews or whatever, you'll know that that's, that's around the first or second or latest third grade. It's sort of, it's in that area. It, the human brain, which has evolved for a million years, <clears throat> evolved so that we can walk, we can talk, and do things quite naturally. Reading is only 3,000 years old. It's relatively new, so you have to learn it. And if you can learn it, then you can do a lot of other things. So here's the question. Can a child learn to read on his or her own? And the answer, which I don't have because we have to run an experiment, this is a real experiment. Nicholas is going to be scientific for the first time in his life. We're going to do this with control groups. We're going to do it. We take all our biggest critics, because we get criticized a lot, take all our biggest critics and have them help us design the tests, and we're effectively going to drop tablets out of helicopters into villages that have nothing, no literacy, no electricity, no something, and we'll go back a year later and see if they can read. Now, <clears throat> the reason this actually makes more sense than it sounds is that how did you learn to read? Well, I assume that most people in this room are relatively privileged, at least to the point that your parents might have read you a book at night. And when you sat anybody who is a parent and has read their children books, you know that they, they, they know that they can't read, but they know that they're words. How many of you had an experience where the child reads you the book? They've just memorized it, of course. They're not reading it, but they've memorized every word right down to the page flips. So you flip the page and they say the words. And then you try and cheat because you're in a hurry and you switch two pages. Ha ha ha. Yeah, you never don't get, immediately they say, oh no, 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 you skipped the page. Well, so that isn't learning to read, but it's an awareness. Tablets can do that. You can drop these things that have thousands of children's stories that just read themselves to the kid. Then you've got phonetics, you've got other things, but I believe invite me back in a year or two, I believe that we can prove the answer is yes, and in that case, those 70 million kids, at a minimum, could learn to read. Thank you very much.